Right. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for, for coming along. I hope you've all been having a, a good day so far. Um, my name is Eric. I'm a, a freelance web developer. I live in, in, in Brighton. Um, and over the, the last few years, I've worked on websites and also quite a lot of native iOS and Android mobile apps. Um, and in, in both of these, I've, I've been using Drupal to manage a lot of the, the content. And I've spent some time over the last year researching ways that we can improve the responsiveness and the resilience of both websites and apps when we have poor network conditions. Um, so I want to start by looking back to um, 2007. Uh, this is a Drupal website from 2007. Um, and the reason I'm showing this is because that kind of site we would have looked at from our home or office and there would have been a fixed uh, connection through uh, modem or broadband or something. Um, but you were either online or you were offline. And that would either work or it wouldn't work. Uh, but also in, in 2007, um, this device, uh, this came along. Um, the iPhone, first iPhone was released, and later Android phones. Um, and this changed things a little bit because um, once we could use the, the internet on a phone, um, we started carrying around the internet with us and we used it in all sorts of different places and took it outside. And the conditions that we used this thing became kind of inherently more hostile than we were used to. And when um, later developers started to write native apps, and this, this environment, uh, this kind of mixed environment was a given right from the start, and, and people were aware of it and, and kind of designed their apps to cope with it. Um, and we can learn a lot from what native app developers have done to being resilient to, to network failures. There's, um, there's an expectation with uh, a native app that you know, when I press one of these icons on the screen, it's going to work. Uh, and sadly, that's not really true for the web. And we get this kind of, there's no internet connection, nothing I can do. Um, it's just not, not going to work. Um, and in fact, it's, it's even worse than that. This is um, loading a, uh, a website on the screen. And compare that with starting up a native app, and, it, and it, the native one pops up straight away the um, website is still loading. Um, and then when they, when they both load, we, we see the content of the website, um, but we've already been looking at the tweets. This is actually, um, this is actually quite a good example. This, this Swiss rat. If, um, if this network connection had failed, the website wouldn't have appeared at all. I'd have seen the tweets, I wouldn't necessarily have any more tweets, but I could at least read something. And there's a lot of apps there that have been built that is kind of purely to show the same content that we have on a website, and, um, but also to cope with the offline situation. Um, this, this conference has an app, um, which, is, which is a nice app to use, um, but it's primarily showing the same thing as, as, as on the website. And I, I can't help but feel this is a big duplication of effort. You've got, to, you've got a website and you've now got to write you know, two or more native front ends on top of that. Um, and also it's quite, it's quite onerous for the user to have to go and, and download an app. They've got to go to the app store. and um, There's several clicks involved in kind of getting um, getting an app on the phone which shows them what they were kind of already looking for in the first place. And when we sort of look at this in a bit more detail, it's, it's the same hardware that we're, that we're using. Um, it's the same, same network with all its frailties. And we're seeing the same information, the same, the same stuff that we're looking at on the screen. 
So the only difference is in the software. On one, we're using a, a, a native API, and on uh, the other, we're using a browser. So I've put together a quick demo site, which um, is very, very simple. It's the kind of site we might have for a conference. Um, I've got a home page, a, a schedule page, um, and a few other static pages. But there's, there's no login here, there's no forms, um, nothing. It's just the most basic kind of brochure site. But it's a, it, it's a good example for doing some simple improvements. So what I, what I wanted to ask myself is, is, can we take the site and can we make it so that whenever somebody visits it, um, we can ensure that they can go back later and uh, even if they don't have Wi-Fi or a mobile signal, um, still see it. Um, conference Wi-Fi can be a bit, um, a bit <coughs> hit and miss. It's, it's, it's good here, but not, not everywhere. Um, so can we provide something that a delegate could rely on? And um, yeah, how far are we off being able to do that? So some of this stuff is a bit, is, is a bit new and a bit raw. Um, the browser support is, is not complete, but um, it's good to have a look at and see where, where things are going. Um, so the, the, the technology I want to kind of talk about mostly is the thing called the service worker. It's a relatively new API that browsers have. Um, Consider it like a, a client-side proxy, um, which is a, a programmable layer between the, the document and the network. Um, probably an easier way to think of it is like having a little mini web server running on your phone that can then talk to another server. So that if that network connection is broken, you can still interact with it. It can do a number of things. Um, most, notice, most notably, it will handle the, the network requests that you make from your browser to a web server, and it will go through this worker. Uh, it can also programmatically access the, the, the browser's cache in a way that you, you can't do um, with, with, kind of, with a, the normal browser cache is quite transparent. You don't really interact with it, but you, you, we'll see later that you can do it with this. Um, a couple of other things that they can do, which I won't have time to talk about today, but um, you can send push notifications from a server to a browser using this. And there's also um, a kind of background sync where, you know, if you are offline and you wanted to post a comment on a blog, then we can accept the comment and then post it when you're, when you're later online. So what do we need to um, set one of these things up? Um, it's quite straightforward. Um, when, we, when we load a page, we want to register a service worker. Uh, so I've put this, this code in, um, and I've put it inside this if. So we're just doing a test to see if the browser supports service worker, then let's do this. Uh, if it doesn't, <coughs> if it's an older browser, nothing, nothing happens. Uh, we're not going to penalise anyone for using an older browser. They'll get the same experience they, they had before. But we want to do this as a, as a progressive enhancement for uh, browsers that can do it. So then I, I, I register this service worker and I pass in the name of a script, uh, this SWJS, which will tell the service worker what to do. We'll come to that in a minute. Um, but I want to look at this this scope parameter quickly. Um, that's interesting because now once this worker is up and running, any pages that we load within that scope will use the service worker for all of their requests. So that includes images, fonts, um, things from a uh, CDN, any kind of Ajax requests that we post or get. 
uh, analytics, that kind of thing. Everything will go through this worker. Um, and the, the script for um, setting up the worker, we can, we'll put it in, but we'll just leave it empty for now. So at the moment, just by, just by doing that, we have a service worker. It doesn't do anything, but it is there. Um, uh, so if we have a look at this demo site, um, this is in, in Chrome, this is a Chrome developer tools. We'll open up those tools and we can, we can see it running and we can inspect it as if in the same way that we inspected the, the browser window, we get a list of, um, I've got the console, um, and we can see that network requests that the worker makes. So the service worker runs independently of the document window. And it stays there even if we close, uh, close the window down. If we close the browser down, it will go to sleep. Um, and then when we come back later on and open up the browser, the worker will wake up again um, and start running. So at the moment, it's, it's not really doing anything useful. But we're going to add to it so that the requests that we make get routed through the service worker. So, These things are primarily event-driven, um, and what we do is we write some JavaScript code to respond to certain events if we're interested in them. Uh, there's quite a few events, but the, the two most interesting ones are the kind of install events. So whenever we first set up this, this worker, we can put some code in here that runs. Um, second one is a fetch event, and that means whenever we ask the worker to go and get something, um, we, we put code in here. Typically what we'll do is, is, in the first one, we'll download some things that we, we always want. So maybe the CSS, maybe um, some scripts and things. Uh, and typically in the second one, we'll put something uh, to behave in a certain way, depending on the state of the network. Um, and if we, if we look at this second event, um, we can pretty much put what we want in there um, and what we want to end up with is giving back something that, that is HTML. Um, this is a really trivial example, but it kind of shows that we get this, we get this event object which has a request within it. We can kind of examine that, and then we, we pass back a response. Um, but if we want to make that a little bit more useful, we need to uh, look at a couple of other APIs and, and come back to that. The first thing I want to talk about is something called promises. So we'll do a lot of asynchronous things. Going off to load something from the network is, is time consuming. Uh, and promises are, are widely used in the functional programming world, but they, they can be a little tricky to get your head around. Um, we need a way to get back something um, when asking a question that hasn't yet been answered. So we have this promise, and it will either it will either resolve if it was successful, or it will it will reject if it wasn't. Um, and we handle that by supplying two functions to say do this if it if it resolves, or do this if it rejects. Second thing to, to mention is this um, fetch API. Um, if you've used something like jQuery to do AJAX requests, this will look a bit familiar, but what we're saying is, is go and get a response from a URL um, and do something if, if it's successful and, or do something else if it's not. Again, that uses the promise. Um, the, finally, there's a, this cache API that I mentioned. Um, which is, it's a little bit different from the inbuilt browser cache because we can programmatically access it. We can choose what to put in there, what to get out. Um, and we can also get out things even if they're stale, um, which is kind of where that comes in really handy for showing things that are offline. Um, so we have a bit more control over what gets stored in there and what doesn't. 
Um, and we can inspect the, the cache um, in, the, in the browser's dev tools. So we'll see that, that demo that we visited earlier. Once I ran it with the service worker, I put these um, CSS files and other resources in there. So quickly, a couple of other techniques for caching data. So it isn't, there isn't really a, a great one-size-fits-all for us to say this is how you make content work offline. Um, some things are fine. Um, some article or blog post could easily, it doesn't matter if we see something that's a bit old. Um, other things like sports results, um, you don't want to see something that's half an hour old if you're looking at the, the football scores. Um, so that really needs to be current. So we need to kind of bear this stuff in mind. Uh, okay. Um, so we will start with the um, start with an approach that is kind of standard to what we have now. So this this idea of only going to the network. Um, that's pretty easy. We just this is our um, fetch event and service worker. All we do is, is, is um, respond with a promise that says fetch the same request. Um, that's not going to do anything different than your browser is doing now. Um, but it does go through the service worker. Um, and if we want to, now we'll go and improve that by saying, um, if you can't go to the network, let's go to the cache. So we'll start off by, in the, in the fetch handler, by calling this request, calling this fetch, uh, I'm giving it the same request. And what we want to do next is to say, if that fails, fall back to the cache. Um, so we'll put in this, um, we'll put in this function on network error and to say, um, if it doesn't work, look in the cache to see if the uh, response matching that request is in there. Uh, if it is, then um, then, then send it back to the um, to the client. If it's not, then we'll just fail like we did before. Um, we'll then add another um, another function to say that if the if the request did work and we did get a response back from the server from the network, we'll put that we'll put a copy of the response into the cache. So we can say, well, we've got this response. I need to save it for next time. Um, and that makes a, a big improvement, because now um, we can look at that, uh, that site again. Um, and we'll load it up the first time. And then we will go and put the device into flight mode. And now when it's done that, it's, it's, it's cached a load of, put a load of things into its cache. Um, and we're in flight mode, but we can carry on using the site. Because what, what's happening here is that we're going to that, um, we're looking at that fetch event. Uh, I'm just going to close the browser down and, and come back and you'll see that it's still there. So what happened there is we looked at the, the fetch event and we said, uh, we tried to the network first, and that failed, so we went for the cache. But the user is none the wiser, they get the page. And they got the page straight away. But that's, that's really only one case of offline. We've, we've handled this flight mode. Um, but we haven't handled this scenario, where the network is very up and down, and it can kind of come and go. We haven't handled this scenario, where we've got perhaps a, a, a very... Um, faint signal. Um, well, we haven't handled this scenario, where it may or may not work at all. Um, uh, and we haven't handled also we haven't handled the kind of server failures as well. So you know, the, the, the kind of S3 outage that was that happened a, a few days ago um, is also it makes the site offline. <coughs> and if, if the user has uh, already got some pages in their in their cache, then they're going to be less affected by it. Um, <coughs> so 
So this, this kind of waiting um, that we saw earlier, um, this slow thing, is, 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 is kind of by design because when we, um, <coughs> when we view a web page in the browser, um, The operating system has to talk to an HTTP, and that has to kind of send a request out via the computer's network connection. It sends out packets of data to a router. They go across the wire to other routers, and um, that gets, again, picked up by a server and reassembled into HTTP uh, into something that can, can build our response. Once it's done that, all that has to come, that data has to come all the way back. And only when it comes back do we get to see the page. That can be quite time consuming. Um, but also, let's, um, let's have a look at what happens when something goes wrong. So, those packets are being sent out, and we know that it's going somewhere, but nothing's coming back. We're not here, we're not being told about failure, we're just not hearing anything at all. So the only thing that the browser can do in that scenario is, is wait. Uh, in fact, the operating system waits, and then after a while it will just give up. And at that point we get the timeout that we see. Uh, and this is, we have to do this so because um, HTTP is a reliable protocol. We, we know that it's got this kind of, it, it will either work or not, or fail, but we'll know either way. Um, but actually, by we've got this unreliable network underneath where anything can happen. So the only way that we can um, provide that uh, certainty of, 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 of and reliability is by implementing a timeout. Um, so what we need to, to learn from that is that this kind of offline state takes time to determine, but perhaps more importantly than that, the, the user might decide you're offline before the computer does. So um, the kind of operating system timeouts are quite, are quite generous, but you know, very often you'll just see the spinner or the blue bar at the top and just give up. So can we do any better than that? And, um, this is really the, the concept of offline, doing offline first, is that we assume that um, the user is offline, and we try and give them something straight away if we can. Um, and then we really want to treat the network as an enhancement, if possible. Um, and if we, can get, if we can get to a point where we somehow decouple the slow network interaction from the user pressing something and doing something, um, then we get a really nice user experience because people aren't pressing or clicking a link and having to wait. Uh, and this is what this is what native apps do well. So I showed the Twitter app earlier. Um, I fire it up, I get that, and then after a few seconds, I get the bubble that says new tweets. Um, but I could start reading the tweets before then. Um, and if the network request had failed, I might have got, I probably wouldn't have seen that new tweet, I might have got a message saying you're offline or something, but it's a lot more, um, it's a lot nicer than just seeing a blank screen. So, to do that, we need to, to load some things in advance. Um, and I mentioned earlier that we had a, a handler to do um, install, so when, when the service worker is first run, um, and we can use that, we need to just, um, uh, it's, it's pretty simple what I did with that um, demo site, it's just to call fetch and get certain URLs, all the pages that I always wanted to have offline, I uh, just put them in the cache. And that means the first time I visited that website, the resources were downloaded and they were put in the cache, ready to go. We also need to, to change the fetch handler a little bit because um, before we added a, a, a fallback for when the network fails, but what, what we had to do was wait for the network to fail and then 
uh, execute the fallback. If we're going to do offline first, we need to flip that on its head a bit. We need to go to the cache first. Uh, if there's nothing in the cache, then we'll try the network. Uh, if there's nothing in either of those, then we, we can't do anything. But um, So what I'll do is, um, yeah, this is now whenever, this is the fetch thing. I'm going to look in the cache. If it's in there, I'll return the cached response. Uh, if it's not there, I'll fetch the network and then add it to the cache. Um, but I'm going to do, do one more thing. Whenever I, um, whenever I show the user a cache response, um, I need to make sure that I kind of keep my cache up to date, because otherwise I've, I've given them something from the cache and they never ever go and get the, the updated one. So we put in this second network request uh, when I get something out of the cache. Um, and this is a, this is interesting because this is an asynchronous, this, this um, ILF9, it's, it's an asynchronous call, uh, but we're not going to wait for it to come back. We're going to uh, go back straight away and give the cache page to the user. Um, another thing I wanted to do is um, <coughs> kind of, I wanted to avoid showing somebody an old page. Um, even if I'm going to later update it, I don't really want the user to see something that's, you know, t uh, could be, well, it could be hours old, it could be days old. So, um, in our fetch handler, we had, um, I'll just go back and show it, we're actually going to get, we're actually going to get two responses. Um, we're going to get either the cached one, we're going to get the cached ones, and then we're also going to get another one from this, this second fetch that we do. Um, and what I wanted to do was to show, um, I wanted to compare those two responses and uh, see if anything's changed. And if it has, I want to pop up a little um, thing on the screen or something saying that a, um, some, some content has <coughs> changed. Um, And I can do that by, I do that in the service worker. I have access to my two responses. I can compare them um, either byte for byte or I can compare them with some kind of header. Um, and then I, I can t send this message to, to the, uh, the browser window to say a certain URL has been changed. Um, uh, and in my, uh, in my document, um, in the script, in the, in the document, I listen out for those messages and to say um, this data has changed and show a message. Um, <coughs> and we'll have a look at that might, how that might work. Um, so I'm going to carry on browsing through the site and find a particular page. Now I know that this page will, will have changed now. We're going to get the cached version, but it's also, I know it's changed. Um, and then once my second fetch finished, I know that it's changed and I can pop up this little um, message to say reload it. Uh, and that's just a link to the page. So if somebody um, clicks on that link, will load, um, they'll load the page again, it will come back through the cache which has been updated. Um, and this whole process of checking will, will happen again. But the second time it won't have, probably won't have changed, so I'll never see that message. Um, and that's, that's really nice um, because if, as a user I got to see the page straight away um, and I still have, I have the new one um, but if that page hadn't changed I'd have just kind of seen it straight away and I would never know that it have been updated, I'd never know that I wasn't looking at um, some freshly fetched content. It's, it's the right content for people to see, um, but I saw it really quickly. Uh, and this is kind of now getting, this is closer to the experience that people have with, with native apps where, you know, things are just loading in the background and uh, separated out from, um, from the, the the, the pressing of the link. So I don't have this sense of pressing something and having to wait. 
time. Uh, um, there is a um, there's a Drupal module called I don't have a slide for this, but there's a Drupal module called uh, PWA. It stands for Progressive Web App. Uh, progressive Web Apps is, is a kind of a, a larger uh, is a sort of marketing term that is used. People like Google are using it to describe um, things like offline technology, also the push notifications, and also just um, <coughs> making websites that are essentially installable. Um, I can add a um, I can add something to this site called a, a manifest file. It's just a JSON file that it kind of explains uh, a little bit about what my site does and, and gives it an icon and a color scheme and things like that. But if I if I was to do that on Chrome here, I would get a, um, a pop-up that says, um, "Do do I want to add this? Um, do I want to add this site? Do I want to install it on my home screen?" Um, so there it just sits alongside. Um, all the other native Android apps. Um, the, um, the the Drupal module that I that I mentioned is, um, is is a kind of first attempt to try and uh, make a progressive web app out of a Drupal site. Um, it works by kind of, um, essentially sort of spidering the pages that, that get output and. Making a, compiling a list of resources like style sheets and things, uh, and then trying to build this service worker script for us. Um, so it works quite nicely. So there's a few things that uh, it doesn't it doesn't work for every situation, but it's um, it's quite a nice first attempt. Um, it's a long way off being kind of production ready, uh, but if you are interested in kind of how these things work, then um, be worth doing that. Um, I've also got some. Uh, some resources that are particularly useful. Um, there's um, quite a few videos from Google I.O. on this topic that are, that are quite good. Actually, the first link has a list of all the others, so um, don't worry if you don't get them all down. Um, I've also written up most of the, um, the content of this talk into a, into a blog post, um, and I'll, I'll tweet that link. Out. Um, so just to just to kind of summarise, I think that this um, this is a very sort of interesting topic going forward. I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of apps that you know, could be websites, um, and I think that there's a a lot of small things that we can do to improve websites as well, to maybe make it less necessary to, to write an app alongside it. Um, and it's very easy. This is um, it's very easy to add this sort of stuff incrementally. So you could start by adding a, a service worker to cache your style sheets um, and just make them load a bit faster. And then maybe you could cache the home page and have a custom offline page, um, and then you could kind of take it one step further and say that when I, I could maybe have an option to cache all of all pages in a particular category, things like that. Um, but we can start to add little bits and pieces, and we can start to add it for browsers that support it at the moment, which is Chrome and Firefox and Opera and. Um, So, um, thanks for listening. Included with browsers, and um, so Chrome 
Firefox and Opera, they will have it. You can, you, you write then um, some JavaScript code in your, um, al al along, along with your website to say, um, start the service worker and do this with it. Um, so you, there's nothing that the user would have to do in advance of that. Yeah, um, there, there are going to be there are going to be situations where it doesn't work. Um, probably the most um, uh, the most obvious one is, is Safari, which doesn't support this. Um, but I, I would sort of say that don't um, don't hesitate to use it, even though it's not supported in every browser, because um, there's there's no real harm done. Um, to anyone that doesn't have it, they just they have what they had before. Um, there's also scenarios where it, 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 you might run out of cache space and things. So I think it's it's probably important to see this as a as an improvement to a website rather than saying this is you're now uh, completely ready to replace a, a native app. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, um, how long does the service work itself cache for? Suppose you want to update, you want to push out an update from the service worker. How does that work? Okay, um, each, each time you, uh, in every page, you would put, you would say, this page is a service worker. There's actually, I think you can replace that script with a link tag uh, right. in the header um, now. But then what will happen is the browser will make another request to the service <coughs> worker and it will compare the two. If you've got a new script, uh, it, will, it will download that one. And it will kind of keep it in the background until you, um, until you close all your tabs down on that site. And once it's done that, uh, the, the new service worker will replace the other one. And there is another event called uh, update, which, uh, where you can run things like kind of putting in caches or, or doing whatever you want in there. Would the service worker be inside its own scope and able to say, no, you can't have a new one? Uh, I, I choose to get myself from cash instead. I don't like a new one. Um, service worker. I think it. I think it. It bypasses. I don't think you can use the service worker to serve up a new one. I think. Okay. I think there are various things in there to sort of stop you shooting yourself in the foot. Uh, there's also a uh, there's a hard limit on the, the uh, cash expiry time of the service worker script. So like 24 hours. So after which. Um, it will always get a new one because otherwise you could potentially um, serve up a, a bug in the service worker and kind of it will be there on your client's site forever. So. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. How does it? Um, what are you talking about you know, the, the cache being full. I mean, how 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 would you handle um, sort of cache limitations or um, what would would it just kind of Yes, it might request, it might fail when you try and put something in, or it might just throw something else out. Mm -hmm. um, so you've kind of got to be prepared that something might not be in the cache. I know mm -hmm. I sort of said, yes, we've got all this programmatic access to it, and we can kind of depend on it. But that's that's perhaps. It. We can depend on it a bit more than yeah. we otherwise could. But there'll be something um, in the cache API. Yeah, it will, uh, probably the promise will reject. Oh, right. um, yeah. I think there was, I heard some talk about a kind of a sort of two levels of storing. One which was kind of where you could really put something on there that would be quite permanent mm. um, and that would also need a permission from the browser. But I don't know how. Um, I don't know how far along that is. Oh, is, is, there a, is there a restriction on the resources that you can store in this and you can start filling it up with videos or all? I guess maybe you could. But... There, there is, but uh, there is a limit, but it's not, um, it's not well defined and it's, yeah. it's varies according to the user. Um, and there's, 
like browsers use certain heuristics to say, right, I'm going to get rid of this stuff out of the cache yeah. first, and then that one. So, so the bottom, bottom line is, um, don't absolutely depend on it. Just yeah. kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So you say uh, with the module, you can create uh, an application with a button like uh, install the website, like a uh, web app. Um, to add it to home screen. To add it to the home screen. Yeah, to add it to the, to have that add to home screen, what you need is a service worker and a um, manifest file. The manifest is just a text file, it's just JSON to say this is uh, what my application is called, and, and it has a few other things describing it. Uh, if you, sorry, sorry go ahead. My question was, what about the cache invalidation? Why do you do that? Is it still 24 hours? Um, oh, longer? well, it's, what gets added to the home screen is just a shortcut. Um, the service worker will stay there um, permanently, um, and it will kind of stay there in a sort of sleeping state. Uh, and then you might come back to it much, much later. Um, when you come back to it, every time you come back to it, the browser will check to see if there's an update. It's a bit like saying there's an updated version of this software, do you want to install it? Um, but it, it will just do it. It will install it the next time around. Yeah. Um, example you be, which was sort of a really like probably in a situation where there's a lot of bytes happening, probably you're spinning a survey on like, yeah. How would service workers work in that situation? Um, how would it work in, the, in something more interactive? Well, they were probably a form. Yeah, more, more of a write throughput, like probably we are putting a form right through. Yeah. Um, so the basic kind of mechanism of when I send a form, if I click the button to say submit, it sends it makes a post request to the server. Um, that request would be routed through the service worker. Um, and you could, if you wanted to, um, write some code in there that does something. Um, it's quite hard to um, it's quite hard to do that sort of thing offline because you've got this um, you've got to use something like background sync to say right well, I've now got this content I need to send it back to the server, um, but I might be doing that much later, and then it becomes really difficult to tell the user that you sent it and. Um, it's quite a hard uh, problem to solve. Um, uh, so, but yeah, it can it can do. I mean, Facebook has that sort of thing. I think when you write a post, it, if you're offline, it just sort of sits in a kind of outbox type thing. Um, yeah, does that? Uh, yeah. Um, okay, so the first first question is can um, like, can the phone start making lots of requests without you knowing about it and start eating up your data? Um, yes, it can. I think um, I think that's probably something that will maybe get addressed in the future. There, there might be some um, opt-in, uh, but at the moment it is kind of a bit bit unknown, but there's lots of ways in which browsers can do that anyway, so they can start preloading on the pages um, and start kind of like loading lots of resources in the, like you could easily load a background video without realising it and um, but also apps. Yeah. Uh, sorry? Apple Blocks, you could start loading background videos with background. Right, yeah, maybe. Um, Make the 
you suddenly get signal. Oh, right, okay. And then make the request. It only makes the request when you first. No, if you. Um, so if you're offline and you make a request, um, the, the, in the example that I had, it will try and uh, try and get it from the cache, and try and get it from the network. <coughs> the network might fail, and it, it would fail in that in that sense. If it's not going to wait and then wait till you come back online, it's just going to it's, it's just going to that promise is going to reject. Uh, it's it's going to fail that network request. Yeah, so um, Yeah, background sync is is, um, is is a bit less uh, it's a bit less clear at the moment. It's, yeah. There aren't really that many good examples. Um, and just the other question about Safari is is um, is, is is right. And there's actually um, there's actually a good uh, a good website um, which well if I can get it up um, is. Service worker ready. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> and it's not really <laughs> And when you're presenting, put your laptop into oh, turn the Wi Fi off so you know to do. But yes, um, where is it? Perfect. Um, this is quite a good. Um, Good resource for seeing uh, kind of browser <laughs> support for all the different components. So, um, yeah, it's not there for Safari. It is in development for Edge, actually. That's um, quite a recent development. Um, but you can see that things like promises, they are starting to work on. So. <coughs> yeah, yes? Um, so, If you get it into Drupal Core at the moment, I think it would be it would be something that a config module would add on, and that that PWA module is is kind of one attempt to do it. Um, it's uh, it's probably that like, like that demo. Everything up until the first bit of the demo I did with that PWA module, not not the little box that popped up and said uh, this is a change, but um, so. I think just kind of, if there was an initiative, probably it would be the first thing would be to say, um, are there any things about Drupal that make it difficult to write service so Um And I think those things would probably get addressed by a contrary module. Great. Thanks, right. Thanks very much.